off and I'll pass it to you. Good deal. All right. Welcome, everyone. It's one o'clock. It is Thursday. We have a nice short week here in the U.S. anyway, and I'm pretty stoked. So uh, I'm Steve. I'm the host. I'm the creator of MSP Webinars, and welcome to another installment. Today, we're going to have a really fun one. But first, let me tell you about some things we've got coming up. Uh, Tuesday next week, we're going to be joined by Pulseway. And uh, no offense, Eric, but Pulseway is going to teach us about their RMM product. And uh, they may even talk about their PSA product a little bit. I think, you know, if, if, you're in the, if you're in the market for a PSA RMM, you know, combo, give it a look. That's all I'll say about that right now. And then Thursday next week is the uh, roundtable. So uh, if you go to the website tomorrow, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to have a whole new look and feel for the upcoming webinar section. So that way you guys will be able to see not only the upcoming webinars, but also the upcoming member breakout sessions. And uh, I, I think it's going to make it a lot easier for you guys to be able to find things. Today, however, today we are joined by the one, the only, Eric Harless. Harless. I would. I almost said Eric Harless. It would have worked that way too. It does actually. It spell checks that way sometimes, <laughs> so uh, you wouldn't have been too far off base. So uh, Eric is with Solar Winds Backup, and Eric, you're you're actually an engineer over there, right? Um, the actually, a senior senior product manager. Um, so oh, I, I do roll up into the engineering fancy. side. Um, that's that's good. So I know, so, yeah, I know. As I said, I know where all the skeletons are buried and uh, and everything with the product. So I should be able to take you through uh, a good roundup today of, of feature function, um, and then of course address any questions that come up. Well, perfect. Well, hey, thanks for doing this today. Um, and I I actually launched a, a poll. So for those of you that are here in Zoom, the answers are anonymous. I'm not going to you know go run tell Eric. Oh, these guys, these guys aren't using your stuff. You should go talk to them because he doesn't know who's here or any of your emails anyway. Um, so if you guys can answer that just so we can talk about it later, that would be awesome. I'd really appreciate that. Um, meanwhile, Eric, why don't, why don't you kind of dive in? I think you're going to show us a demo today of SolarWinds Backup, which That's... I hear is kind of the bee's knees in backup products. Um, so we're we're pretty proud of it. Um, I've been with the organization now um, five years this week, actually. Um, so I've seen it come through uh, a couple different variants and names. Um, the the product itself evolved from uh, IOSO Online Backup, which was originally acquired by GFI Software, which became Logic Now, which merged and, and incorporated um, to to become SolarWinds MSP. So we've got some history here. It is software that originally started as an OEM agreement um, between the two organizations and um, uh, turned into a purchase and so it's it is an acquisition to a certain extent but all of our development all of our work and all of our integrations um, are done in-house we still have that original development team the product and let me actually get my sharing turned on so we can see that um, so the products available for anybody that would like to um, uh, start a trial uh, solarwindsmsp.com uh, select uh, backup from the product section here on the left and you've got the ability to request uh, a quote or, or trial now. Also from the same UI, you're gonna be able to log into uh, the various SolarWinds MSP products. So you can log directly into backup and you'll get a web-based management console. It's a, a full multi-tenant application. Um, it is uh, cloud first, meaning you have to have an internet connection to utilize this, um, but we have hybrid capability as well so that you can have local copies of your data for rapid recovery um, and, and that extra layer of protection that, that your customers uh, want and need. Um, today we'll be talking about the standalone version of SolarWinds Backup. So um, I know you mentioned another RMM solution out there. Uh, you don't have to utilize SolarWinds RMM solutions, uh, whether it be in central or the, the uh, remote monitoring and management offering to use SolarWinds Backup. Uh, we can work right alongside anybody else's RMM solution. It would be silly of us to think that, that people are only going to use our application. Um, so we've built Backup to work across the board, but we do have two specific integrations of it that work uh, very closely with our RMM products. Um, so you can have the integrated choice, or you can have a standalone option. Uh, feature and functionality is gonna be about 95% the same. It's really just a question of different deployment and different reporting structures. Um, and we're obviously constantly striving to uh, 
um, narrow that feature gap and have feature parity across all the platforms. But talk to your account managers here at SolarWinds MSP and they can tell you which one is best or right for your environment um, you know, while you're doing your evaluations. So if we start that login process and we wanna go into SolarWinds Backup, you're gonna be presented with a web-based management console. And I'm already logged in here to save you the, the delay in time frame of two-factor login and, and those kind of pieces, but you're gonna get presented with this um, single pane of glass, this at a, at, a, um, uh, at, a at a moment's notice view of what's going on. So you can see I'm logged in as um, uh, HH Computing IT, that's my MSP level. And I've got 19 active uh, devices under management here. I'll expand that out a little bit. Um, no workstations, 19 servers, um, uh, roughly two terabytes of data selected, uh, taking up about four and a half or four and a quarter terabytes of data in the cloud. That's all my retention periods, all my archiving. Um, I'm keeping 90 days of retention plus end of month archiving capability. So uh, we're looking at about a 2X, a little bit over 2X utilization today. Um, from a capacity perspective with that level of retention. So uh, very, very nice data deduplication, compression and encryption that is uh, performed by the client locally. And it um, uh, does that local, uh, sends the data over a TLS 1.2 uh, tunnel to the cloud. So uh, your data is fully encrypted in our data centers. Um, the data centers are gonna exist globally. Uh, let's see, at last count, that was uh, 17 data centers in uh, 12 countries on four continents. And these are all ISO 27001 um, uh, certified um, secure data center locations. The environment we're looking at here, um, as I said, it is my, uh, my uh, MSP or my sample MSP environment. This is a, a lab environment that I maintain. Um, so it is multi-tenant. Um, I've got uh, SolarWinds North America, HEH Computing IT, and then I've created individual regional offices to represent my end customers, uh, or uh, if you're looking at it from an IT pros perspective, your branch offices, your campuses, your uh, medical centers, what have you. It'll, it'll conform to any type of distributed environment. So I can see all of my devices at a root level, or I can drill down into individual locations to look at just those systems in that location uh, represented by these various columns down here. So device name, customer, the types of data sources we're protecting, um, at a glance here, the selected size and the amount of use storage for individual devices, um, a color bar to look at the uh, success and failure over the last 28 days. Um, obviously, we keep more than 28 days if you like to retain the data longer, you can do that, um, but you can mouse over here and look at any given day uh, to see how that uh, status was. The last status of your, your backup operation, any errors that might have existed here, we had one that was not started. Uh, I've got a linkable error that I can drill into when the last successful backup was. So, you know, backups today for some of these devices, uh, some of these are virtual machines, look like they've been off here for uh, the last two weeks. Um, so there's probably need to be restarted. And you notice that there's an alert or a warning next to these showing that you are out of compliance. Um, same kind of visibility in the pie charts up above. So uh, my breakout of servers and workstations, my breakout of success and failure. So 95% of these have been backed up successfully. Uh, 19 completed, one was unsuccessful. Um, now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't tell you when it was successful. It just means that it, the last time it ran, it was successful. Over here to the right, uh, only 15% of the devices have been backed up in the last 24 hours. That means that 85% uh, here um, are more than 48 hours since they were last backed up. So those are gonna be my troubleshooting items. I didn't wanna give you guys a green dashboard to say, oh, look, it's perfect all the time. As you know, with backup, you run into issues. You can run into problems. You know, users uh, make changes. They, they modify configurations. They stand up new servers. And without telling you what's in, incorporated there, there's new applications. Hey, where the SQL server come from? You get that virtual machine or server or application sprawl. So you need to be able to identify and protect that. Um, so all of these charts are active. So if we come in here and click on the uh, three that are less than 24 hours, I get just that filter. If I want to go and look at just um, uh, servers or just workstations, I hit that, I get that filter. I want to look at the ones that were unsuccessful. Um, I click that link. Um, oops, let me reset again. I click that link, and here is my single unsuccessful system. Um, so lots of drill down capabilities, um, and there's tons of other filters and options here to show you exactly what you want to see. Um, for instance, um, the duration of a last backup, the current software version, the manufacturer of the hardware. In this case, it's a Microsoft uh, Hyper-V virtual machine, but you'd see that it was a Dell, an HP, um, Optiplex, or, or whatever. 
Um, once again, tons of other systems of uh, settings over here. I'm looking at external IP, internal IP. That's a great way to determine that since these are remote machines, if you're looking at performance issues, well, these machines have got performance issues. They're all going through a specific gateway, uh, while as other machines that don't have performance issues are going through a different route. Um, internal IP addresses, synchronization status between the cloud and the remote, and all of those columns are customizable. So if I want to drag it over to the left here someplace to store it so I can see what I'm working on, I can do that. I want to add new columns for um, you know uh, tons of different items, such as uh, um, the amount of data that's archived, when it was created, uh, the language that the UI is displayed in, the email address, when the service is set to expire. Uh, there's a good 300 different columns here that you can display and customize for the exact status of your backups for troubleshooting or billing or day-to-day -day monitoring and management. Um, since it's about managing by exception, we want you to have um, the problem systems at your fingertips with the right tools to diagnose them. Um, so as you modify and adjust these views, you have the option to come over here and save the views. So I can save my recovery view, a view for cleanup, unsuccessful systems. Um, those views available to you when you log back in and, and to be able to sort through and filter through new customers, problem customers, what have you. These views are also available in your inbox. So you can set these up to email out on a, a daily or weekly basis. That way you're gonna get a summary of, uh, you know, the top 200 devices that meet this criteria for failures over quota, uh, successful, you know, you tell me. That way you can treat your servers and your workstations differently and manage them accordingly, going to different teams inside of your organization. Um, as you've got 10 devices or 20 devices here, it's not a big deal to look at them at one, at one time, but when you get to 200 devices, 300 devices, 1,000 devices, and I've got partners in that, in all of those ranges, um, you, you, you're gonna find that managing my exception is gonna be a lot, uh, a lot more useful. Now, the question might be, how do I get to that 100 devices or 1,000 devices? Because you've gotta deploy this. We are, like I said, a multi-tenant solution. We're designed to uh, allow the MSP to work from his operation center, from his location, without having to go physically on site to do a lot of the backup uh, management deployment. Uh, we're going to work through the customer's firewall. Um, so you've got some abilities here to do uh, remote management. Um, uh, if we come in and grab a device here, bear with me a second, I'll get to uh, one I want to work with. So if I come in and grab a device here um, and select that device, I'll get some more details on what's going on with that device. So uh, an overview of the device configuration, um, its backup history uh, until the beginning of time. So the history of every backup session that's been done for that machine. We'll show you the last 28 days here uh, in this first screen and then the ability to expand to look at all sessions. So what you can see here is that uh, this last backup that ran here at uh, 1 p.m., um, took about a minute for the file and folders, about three and a half, uh, three minutes and five seconds for system state. Um, those are still local only backups, meaning that the backup completed, but it exists only on that local uh, storage, that local speed vault option that we have, the hybrid backup component. And as it slowly synchronizes up to the cloud, that L will go away to represent that it's been fully synchronized and you've got offsite protection, uh, cloud protection, electronic vaulting, however you want to think of that offsite copy. Um, but you're not fully protected until that copy gets off site to be um, uh, covered from things like ransomware or total site loss. Um, we're a client side data deduplication solution. I never send the same data across the wire twice. Uh, so you could say that we're WAN optimized. Um, so when you look over here, you can see this particular VM, it's about uh, you know 13 gigs of files and folders, about 11 gigs of system state. Um, 104,000 files, 96,000 objects in system state. Um, it didn't have to process through those 24, meg, uh, 24 gigs of data. It had to process through about 330 megs of file system data and about 200 megs of system state data, um, uh, about 1,500 files total. That's clickable to see the files that were processed. It only had to transfer up to the cloud, 2.2 uh, megabytes of file system and uh, just under two megs of system state data. So that's the deduplication in work. Uh, or in in um, uh, in process, the average daily change rate we're going to see across all of our customers uh -huh. is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, one percent or less. Uh, obviously, it'll vary hold, by customer. Hold on a second, Eric. I'm sure. so sorry to interrupt. So, the process size and the transferred size, wh why are those different? Oh, so we are uh, a sub-file level uh, data, data deduplication uh, 
uh, product. So I look at the total file size. That was my 13.4 gigs here. I, uh, that's 104,000 files. Um, of that, 335 megabytes of those files had some kind of change inside of them. That's my 1,379 files. Um, because I don't have to transfer the entire file again, I just need to get the portion of the file that's changed at a byte level. I only, uh, I cracked them open. I was only had to transfer 2.21 megabytes of data up to the cloud in order to get uh, those changes out of those files. That's amazing. So 2.21 megabytes of 13.4 gigs. Now an exchange server, a database server, they're gonna have a slightly higher change rate. It might be in the, the 1.2 to 1.5, even the two or three X daily change rate. If you're doing Hyper-V backups and you're getting them at a host level, you got page files and swap files that end up getting uh, backed up as well uh, that you wouldn't see in a file system backup. That's gonna raise my, my uh, transfer rate. But you can get very creative here, creating selections and filters to you know, even illuminate, uh, sorry, eliminate a lot of these um, removed files. So this last list here is a list of files that were in the previous day's backup but are no longer in today's backup. Um, this information is good because it allows you to fine tune your backup. It allows you to see that you're backing up things maybe you shouldn't to see what the largest tra processed or transferred file was. So for instance, if I were to just click on this, it's gonna give me a list of what files it processed through and actually how much data it was able to um, dedupe out of it. So we'll give that a second to look at. Um, so for the most part here, you see that size is this, but the transfer size is zero. That means that file was fully deduped. The only thing that might've changed would have been a, uh, a permission or, or some kind of security attribute to it. If I sort by transferred size, um, uh, objects.data, update log, log, various log files, my user profiles, uh, event log information, you know, 15 megs, I only had to transfer 49 kilobytes. If you saw something that was really large here, like an OST file, uh, a, a dot .bak, a dump file, that could ind indicate that you're backing up things that really don't have any business being protected uh, or that you may not want to have in the cloud. You know, you find an ISO file in here that you're backed up. Well, you know, why are you sending ISO and storing ISO files to the cloud when you've got the original file or you can pull it from an external source? You know, why are you backing up your corporate Google Drive on every you know, user's workstation when you can get an authoritative source backed up from another location? Uh, those kind of things. Make sense? Yeah, this is good so far. Cool. Um, so the overview history, uh, statistics, um, you know, just high level summary of what's going on here, size of storage, use storage, operating system. This is good information because you don't, um, you're not always looking at your RMM. You may not know exactly the components and we don't want you swapping back and forth. So we give you a lot of the control that you might have inside of an RMM solution here natively in backup. Um, for instance, the ability to launch the backup client. This will allow me to launch um, a backup instance, or I've actually got a, a continuous restore, a recovery instance, uh, an offline virtual machine, if you will, that uh, can be booted up in the event of a disaster. And we'll talk more about the recovery options here in a few minutes, but um, remote control to launch the backup interface, make your configuration settings for that client without needing a third-party remote control tool or even opening up a VPN connection to the customer. Plus, you don't disrupt the customer, so you're not. It's not like you're taking over their desktop and doing all these settings. You can manage backup remotely without um, uh, interfering with their day-to-day -day operations. There's also diagnostics. Um, so internal info page here. Um, so the same diagnostics are available, and I'll pull this for. Um, let me pull it for a system that I know I can reach. There we go. If I don't get a couple timeouts, it wouldn't be a real demo, right? So um, <laughs> internal info page, the backup version. Internal info is gonna do some system level diagnostic and it runs in real time so that you can, uh, it's the equivalent of getting a, a dump of your disk structure, um, looking at high levels of your system event log. Uh, it lets you look at profiles and configurations that you made for the device. And it's the equivalent of running a VSS admin locally. Um, so this machine, it's a Windows virtual machine running 2012 R2 um, with uh, two processors and four gigs of RAM. So, you know, minimal configuration, not something I'd recommend uh, uh, a lot of work to be done on. Um, environmental variables, uh, registry entries, what backup features are turned on. Um, but more importantly, because VSS can be a, a good thing for backup and it can be your downfall. 
Um, we can get information here on um, VSS services. So is VSS running? Um, how is it configured? So I've got uh, up to 12 and a half gigs available as maximum storage, but I'm not using any local snapshots right now. We are VSS aware, VSS enabled. So I use VSS to get open file protection. Um, it's gonna get your SQL, your Exchange, your SharePoint, so that you've got live hot application aware backups. Uh, we take care of all the log truncation, log management for those apps. Um, and we snap them at the beginning of the backup so that it is um, application consistent, not crash consistent. And that's very, very important. We do support other apps though, like uh, MySQL, um, Oracle, and then we've got pre and post commands so that you can do any type of custom shutdown for um, your own custom applications or databases. Um, this VSS admin though, um, for each of your writers that are visible, you'll see the status, last error if there was one. Um, as we come down further, uh, you can see what uh, writers are on the system. So if there's a competitive backup and recovery product on here that has its own writer, we'll see that. Uh, we'll see snapshots and, and um, uh, environments that have been created in the past. You can see if they're overlapping. And you might ask, well, why is that important? The, um, when you've got multiple backup applications on the same machine, uh, some people think of that like having a belt and suspenders. You know, you, you've got double protection. And it's not untrue if you configure them properly. The issue that you can run into though is if you um, have them overlapping schedule-wise or overlapping in series, meaning full incremental differentials uh, interrupted by a third-party backup, you could break the chain. So you don't want SQL Enterprise Manager doing SQL dumps and then another product coming in and trying to do offsite backups of that same SQL database um, in the middle. You'll create a case where um, uh, it's more like trying to put two belts through the same set of belt loops uh, and you bust a loop. The um, you know the, the worst thing you could possibly have here is you know two backup applications and you've got two non-recoverable environments. So um, seeing what's going on here, seeing the schedule, seeing the overlap, um, and just planning those out, um, especially if you're doing a migration, if you're ending the end of life for one product and you're moving over to another one, um, scheduling them and, and um, turning them off at the right times or setting them up so some is, in, some is in the beginning of the week or the end of the week, or at least um, you know on the hour, on the half hour, during the morning, during the afternoon, it can be very, very important so that you don't you know, create an environment where you have no protection and you think you've got double protection. So um, one of the questions is, uh, is your platform stored in AWS or Azure? Um, what redundancy do you have to ensure that we have access to the portal in case one of your data centers goes down? Okay. So um, our, our cloud services, um, the, the central management arm or the, or the, uh, the, the platform that we logged into here, this um, uh, backup.management portal um, is a, a cloud service. Um, it is hosted by us. Um, so it's not hosted in Amazon or Azure. Um, and it is a redundant platform. Um, so if this system were to go down, if there were maintenance windows, uh, things like that, it does uh, fail over to a alternate environment. We do schedule some 15 minute or less downtime uh, windows occasionally where we would not um, bring over the failover environment. Uh, but those are scheduled ahead of time and with, uh, with alerts and notices on our site. The storage, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, Multiple data, multiple data centers, multiple countries on four continents. Um, those data centers are uh, private uh, colo data centers where we um, uh, lease rack space. We do own all of our own equipment, um, our storage nodes in those environments. And your data is stored um, in a way that um, one of those nodes acts as a uh, owner, uh, a traffic cop, if you will, the home node. And then there are cabinet nodes or storage nodes that uh, we're gonna relate with that. So if a node were down, uh, a node were offline uh, for maintenance, uh, having a hard drive replaced, whatever, then the um, system would route you to another node. So you're not gonna have an availability issue. Um, you're not sending all of your data to one location. It could even go to another data center. So we've got multiple data centers in the US that we could uh, uh, route to if a, one particular data center were down or not reachable due to uh, ISP or, or route issues. From a recovery um, perspective, oh, go ahead. Oh, and I'm sorry. I just want to clarify some of that. What about compliance where the data needs to stay in a particular country? Data sovereignty, uh, excellent question. Um, so um, uh, I'll talk US and Canada right now. Um, obviously we could talk European Union uh, or uh, 
uh, the UK. So our data is uh, designed to stay in the country or the region where it is configured or provisioned. Um, so if you sign up to as a partner through the US, uh, your data is going to end up in uh, our US data centers. It does not route out of the country or, or to other locations. Um, if you are a multinational company, you can create um, new partners or new uh, sub entities and change that location. So um, if you are dealing with a Canadian firm as well, and the data must stay in Canada, you can configure um, a, a new multi-tenant sub partner so that here's my Canadian location, here's my uh, Australian location, uh, which would go to Sydney or my uh, French location, which would be in Paris and so on. Um, and um, awesome. I can- uh, and, then, and then you were about to answer the second part of my first question about I think the redundancy and things like that, but it, yes. sounded, it also sounded like you already answered that too. So. Um, I, I probably did a little bit. So the redundancy um, from a cloud perspective, you know, this is backup data. So it does exist on a storage node. I'm not duplicating um, storage nodes. I'm not taping, keeping two copies in the cloud. Uh, but since we are a hybrid data protection solution, I do allow you to have, maintain a local redundant copy yourself. Um, which can be used in the event that it was lost in the location, they can resync and so on. That local speed vault I've talked about a little bit, and I'll show that to you here in just a moment, it allows you to maintain on-premise at your customer or your site a full mirror of the cloud data that's fully deduped, compressed, and encrypted. Um, and it's got uh, two benefits. It's one, it's redundant. Number two, it acts as a backup or restore cache so that uh, you can get data faster than WAN speeds. You can get it at LAN or LAN speeds. Um, so I'm going to pull up a column here, which I don't have default right now. Bear with me a second. So I'll get storage location. Uh, let's see. And while, while you're pulling that up, um, will you sign a BAA for HIPAA compliance? Um, yes, we can do those. Um, it does go through our legal department. You just talk to your account manager and um, they can uh, work with you on that. Uh, the data itself is AES 256 bit encrypted. Um, sent over a TLS 1.2 tunnel. Um, the data existing in the data center is non-descript, non-self-describing. Um, and um, our staff, the majority of our staff do not have uh, access to that other than our DevOps guys. So DevOps can access the data if we ask them to. Dev DevOps can access the location, uh, but the data, the data itself is still ones and zeros. We don't have access to your encryption key. Um, you can uh, control private key encryption so that you uh, control the passphrase that's used for the encryption, or you can uh, optionally choose to use our um, uh, system managed uh, uh, passphrase technology where we control the encryption key and manage it for you as part of the application. Uh, but even our employees don't have access to request that only specific security user roles inside of your tenant level uh, can ever request that uh, encryption key. So hypothetically, mm -hmm. if, if Hillary Clinton had her server backed up to SolarWinds Backup and there was a subpoena to SolarWinds Backup to provide that data that's backed up, all you're able to provide is the encrypted data. Here, you have here. no ability to decrypt that data and provide it. Here's, 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 a, disk with, uh, here's a disk with the ones and zeros. And yeah, yeah, random ones and zeros at that point. Um, without that, without that passphrase or without that uh, encryption key that was um, uh, deployed by you, the MSP, or by your end customer, you can't uh, you can't recover that data. Um, and that's a sad story to tell a customer if they forget their key, um, which is why we do offer some of the internal management. The um, you know, it really boils down to your customer and the environment. If you're going to sign, if you're going to sign the BA, or if you're working through that approach, and you're going to manage and store these in some unsecure method in your location, um, where there's potential to, for loss, or where a technician could walk out with the key, then you might want to consider the way to consider our internal management. That way, you've got a secure location. You can restrict access a little bit easier, especially if you're dealing with hundreds of devices, a lot of workstations where you. You know, may, may, may not be making the right, the same margins you do on server protection and, um, uh, you know, possibly a different level of protection, different level of retention. Um, I could talk to that just a little bit. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, any of these devices that are listed here on the, the left-hand side that have um, uh, this little underscore and a random identifier at the end, they were deployed through an automatic deployment methodology that um, 
uh, it defines and records an encryption key for the system. I don't have to keep track of that myself. So if I were to come in and look at this device and come to modification, um, as a uh, MSP user, and I'm logged in at a high level right now, um, I can see the device name, I can see a password, that's for redeployment, but I'm gonna be prompted for that encryption key before it'll ever install. There is no option here. You don't see an encryption option or an ability to request it. Um, if I were a security officer, an authorized user, which can only exist at the MSP or end customer level, then you would have an option here in you, your UI to request your encryption key. You'll get a one-time use passphrase. So you could use it for one install or uh, 24 or, for, or it'll expire in a 24 hour period if not used. So that way you don't have the ability for a technician to walk out um, and, and then have this cache of encryption keys that uh, could give him access to the data. So it's about not just protecting the data today, it's about protecting the data in the future. Uh, I brought up a column here. Let me see if I actually hit save on it. I was talking, so I may not have hit the save button. Here we go. So storage location. So here you can see storage location. This is where the home node is configured. Uh, so the majority of these were configured um, for the United States locations. Uh, although this one, when I configured this uh, CentOS box, um, I specifically chose the Netherlands as a data location uh, for it. So you do have um, a fair amount of control in the standalone product to define the region where the data is gonna be stored. In the integrated versions that we have, the uh, storage location is gonna be locked or tied to the region that you sign up for. Um, uh, so you're gonna have a little bit less control about getting things um, out of your main country or out of your uh, original location. If you are a multinational provider, however, um, then we can uh, uh, pre-configure some of those backend items for you and you'll just make sure you put them to the right container. If you put something in the wrong container, we can take care of that for you as well and, and have the data, the ones and zeros moved on the back end as part of a migration. Um, for instance, you know, you signed up in, um, uh, you signed up in Czechoslovakia and we don't have a data center there right now. So the data ends up, ends up in Germany. Um, as soon as we add a data center there, we could uh, at your request, rehome the data to that new data center location. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, we have uh, a few more questions if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you able to comply with NIST regulations? Uh, NIST. NIST is an interesting one. So I don't do specific tests uh, or certification efforts against NIST. Um, I do comply with a lot of their checkbox items, if you will. Uh, the AES 256-bit encryption, um, uh, the TLS tunnels, um, the, the fact that we've got an ISO 27001 certification on the product and the development process um, can go a long way toward, toward um, uh, checking those boxes. But no, I don't specifically go and uh, uh, run through a, a NIST compliant or a NIST certification. Um, and, and the same can be said for a lot of the other ones out there. There's a ton of different little certs. Um, the backup product itself is not you're not going to find a lot of backup products that are going to say, oh, yes, NIST checkbox, because there's other pieces here, because you control the encryption keys, you control some of the access to your facility, the log into the UI, how do you store your credentials to log into this console, things like that, um, that, that make it more than just a backup question, but I do conform to a lot of the pieces, yes. Uh, next question. What are the different restore options and how can they be accessed? Beautiful, excellent segue. Um, so the backup client, and, and we haven't really talked about deployment here. We haven't talked about what the agent looks like on a system, but there is a software component, an agent that runs on, on, on the uh, client. Um, and we've got several deployment methodologies to get that out either one at a time or in mass. So you can link this to a, um, a software distribution tool to another RMM product to, to batch deploy. Um, the client itself is available here in the download section. So there's a backup client. Uh, we have um, uh, that backup client can do file, uh, application, um, volume level restores, directories, individual files, what have you, to a particular point in time. And you're going to get presented with a browsable UI. You select the files you want to restore and, and put them either directly back where they originally came from, or you can do a redirected restore to an alternate location. There is bare metal recovery. Uh, bare metal recovery, we've got an executable and an ISO image that are available. The executable creates a USB boot stick. The ISO, obviously you would burn to CD. 
do not burn the ISO to a USB stick via something like Rufus. Um, it's not designed for that. If you want a USB stick, we've got a tool specifically for that purpose. Um, but this will load a version of Windows PE, a uh, light version of our client, allow you to lay down the full system, um, disk structures, partition information, and the selected volumes that you want. We synthesize the recovery from a file and folder and a system state backup. So you don't have to lay down the entire machine. You could use just a single volume or even just individual directories. But doing a bare metal recovery, if you don't recover enough to boot, then it's kind of a, a wasted point. So um, you could remove the dump directories and the download directories during a restore to get it back up and running quicker, and then come back in and restore the database and the other items later after your customers are back in business. So it gives you a lot of control. It's not all or nothing. There is um, a recovery console, and I'll bring that up here in just a second, that allows you to do virtual disaster recovery, so physical to virtual, uh, either proactively or reactively. So you can create a VM in Hyper-V or VMware or uh, VHD and VMDK files on disk that um, you know look like uh, the last backup of the system. Those can be created on demand. It recovers the entire image, or they can be um, set up to run continuously in the background and just applies delta changes. So imagine it's two hours to four hours or longer to restore because of the size of the environment on demand. It could be 15 minutes to 45 minutes just to apply delta changes, effectively however long to back up the changes. So that's a nice convenient um, uh, business continuity style option. Virtual Drive is a tool that we have available that bake, makes the backup dedupe store, the one in our cloud or the one in your local vault or both look like a virtual file system attached to drive letter B that's mountable, searchable, browsable. So you can pull out individual files from an Explorer style view. So there's lots of store options available to you. Um, if I switch out quickly to the client, um, let's see here. Um, this is what I want. This is the backup client. This is what's installed on the local machine. Um, and we bring this up in your native, your local web browser. Um, you got a calendar view of what you've backed up. Uh, you got a backup tab where you can see what's configured for selection, um, files and folders, excluding the O and Q drive, system state, the ability to edit and choose what you want to protect down to a file um, uh, or volume level of granularity. Restore, same kind of capabilities. So restore, I want to do a file and folder restore. Um, I'll pick my date. I'll go back to the 27th at 2 p.m., uh, volume C, I want to get my admin tool uh, and my drivers. Um, and you know what? Let me go actually. Let me delete something for us really quick here. Uh, admin tool and config.msi. Wasn't planning to delete anything on the fly, but I will do that for you guys. And I'm sorry, what do you mean? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna delete some files and we'll actually recover these. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no no backup shop backup software should be asked to do that on the fly, right? Uh, we'll get drivers back as well. Okay. Do, do, do. I need a recycle bin. Where's my recycle bin? I don't want to have any smoke and mirrors for you guys here, so <laughs> empty recycle bin. Okay, so to original location, to a new location, skip files that have not changed, um, and start a restore, we'll choose to overwrite. I, I like that. And I gotta say, this is a really nice interface. Thank you. It's, uh, it's taken some time. Uh, we've evolved from a thick client uh, that you installed, which looked very Windows NT4 or 351. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go back to something that's pretty slick. Um, from a troubleshooting perspective, while this is doing its restore here, um, estimated time remaining, files processed, files changed. Um, you know, I can actually come in and look and see what's going on. So we've got um, live logs that are debug logs that we can look at and see what's going on here. Um, so uh, to block content, process file stream, node for stream, uh, entering restore of this file, leaving restore. So full logging while things are going on. This is actually debug level logging so that a tech could look at this or you could look at this while you're doing something. Um, this is more detailed than actually goes into the default standard logs that are stored to the system unless you turn on the debug logging. So you can look 
you can look proactively to see what's going on without having to go pre-configure debug level uh, outputs. Um, all right, so backup systems are only as good as they are being properly configured. Yes. Maintained, tested. So what kind of gotchas are you seeing people doing or more importantly, not doing? Uh, well, people don't test. Um, you know, they used to say test your backups, test your tapes, you know, bring the tapes back and test them later to make sure that they haven't degraded, things like that. Well, we're cloud-based, it's on disk, so we, that's not an issue. Uh, we do consistency checks and inventory checks um, as well to make sure that the data is still where it's supposed to be and, and is available. Um, but a really good test, especially in the day and age of virtualization, is that virtual disaster recovery that we talked about or that I mentioned a little bit ago. Um, our ability to stage the restores, create a VM behind the scenes, boot the VM, create a screenshot for you and, and push, it, push it on our dashboard or email it to you is a great way to prove that you've got um, uh, recoverable systems. Now, we don't go in and start you know, running applications and, and you know, running scripts against uh, items and things like that, but it gives you a bootable system to say, okay, if the system were to fail, I could recover. Um, Sadly, most customers don't do that. They either don't have the resources, they don't have the extra hardware. Um, uh, we try to make it simple. You know, you could even use something like the Windows 10 Hyper-V roll, you know, Windows 10 Pro, and recover to that environment. So, yeah, you're not going to recover a 16-core, 48-gig machine uh, to that environment, but you could recover it in a much lower-scaled uh, configuration, see that the disks are there, uh, go through and mount them and browse them to see that you've got the data. So we can get selective on what you restore, the entire system or just a database, just a file structure, things like that. So, And and you mentioned screenshots. Yes. Um, is is this like automated or are you like- Fully, fully, automated, fully automated behind the scenes. We uh, um, restore the VM, uh, restore the, the system as a VM or update the offline VM. After the restore completes, we boot it. Uh, take a screenshot, shut it back down, post it to our dashboard, or email it to you. Um, let me uh, let me actually show you a little bit of that. So, the that, that restore completed. Uh, just a, a quick summary. I'll wrap it. Um, I look at my calendar. Uh, file and folder restore completed. Um, uh, Twenty six hundred files processed around two gigs of data. A lot of small files. It only had to transfer a gig because it was deduped. It took two minutes to go through plus all my other hourly backup operations happening over here, none of which are taking more than six minutes right here. Um, so the, the restore side, um, when doing restore, um, that virtual disaster recovery I mentioned is what um, gives me the options that I talked about. Uh, my recovery target could be a um, ESX server, for instance. I have an option here to start the virtual machine after restore and take a screenshot. Now, fair warning here, if you start a virtual machine that happens to be a domain controller on the same production network as your running domain controller or exchange server or what have you, you're going to cause problems. We're creating VMs that have the same IP address and same configuration. So uh, just like you cloned it, if you start it up, you're going to, to cause problems. So I always recommend you do this in a isolated network behind a NAT, um, a VLAN, a different subnet, or at a colo, a data center, or in the cloud someplace. So there's um, uh, things you can do here. We do ship the software with a, just a slight amount of rope, enough rough rope to, uh, to get yourself into trouble. Um, but it's a very, very powerful tool. You can do a lot of things. We don't constrain you or restrict you. Um, you can use this to build your own BDR appliance, if you will. So you've got a recovery standby environment at the MSP's location, a colo, a data center, or on-premise at the customer's location, or both. Man, this is a lot to type. <laughs> so, Eric, I don't know if you see it, but I'm actually hand typing closed captions. For Are you really? Okay. For the people wondering, like, wh where did these closed captions come from? And why are they not at all what Eric just said? <laughs> I might have to go back and help you out with those later. Um, so, here, let me, um, let me show you the dashboard. Let me see if I can give you a recovery view that... Um, and, and just to clarify yeah. real quick, so the, um, the recovery view is actually requiring you to, uh, to have some type of local system or like an Azure environment like ready for you to test. It's not, it's not the same as a Datto as where it's going to automatically turn on that 
VM without networking enabled so it doesn't screw anything up, uh, take the screenshot and then shut it back down. So I'm doing I'm doing roughly the same thing that they are. So they they'll take the image, they'll boot it with the the internal native hypervisor that they have. They've got a, a hypervisor in there, um, Zen probably, but I don't recall exactly. Um, anyway, they've got a hypervisor inside of there. They boot it up and they they isolate the network. Um, in my boot process, I'm not isolating a network. I'm not. Uh, so it is up to you to ensure that the environment you're recovering to. Um, the network configuration are set to be a private network configuration uh, behind a VLAN, behind a NAT. But effectively, we're doing the, the same kind of things. Uh, let's see here. And I want to turn Thank on my, I'm going to get my recovery view here. Uh, so here's a saved view that I have. Um, so I've done some BMR, bare metal recoveries on these guys uh, here this year. So January and February did bare metal recoveries on a couple of the systems completed. Um, we've done some virtual disaster recoveries for uh, systems. So you can see the last 28 days of virtual disaster recoveries. So this one was actually recovered today. Um, let me see if I have screenshots. Ah, so here are my verification results. So some of the VDRs have failed for some reasons. Um, uh, here's a verification result. Um, so let's take a look at that one. Uh, here's a screenshot from Virtual Machine. It expires in two weeks. Um, this was a recovery that was um, uh, August 24th. And I love that black screenshot. Screen. Not a good screenshot on that one. Nope. Uh, let's see what. So screenshot is meant to be the login screen. This guy may have been taking long, longer to log in when we grabbed it. So I do also have uh, system event log information here to see services started and so on. So it's, uh, it's twofold, but I like the pretty picture. So let me get another one here and we'll farm out of my environment if uh, maybe that one was just too old that I don't have the, uh, the most recent. Ah, there we go. There's one. Um, so my login screen, really nice today with Windows, you've got an actual time date stamp in the UI. So that way you've got some proof of performance there as well. So um, uh, log information here as well. So that could also be sent out to you via email. Um, I showed you the configuration for one machine, but there is a, uh, what we call a recovery console, which is a multi-instance multi tool. Um, let me see if I have it where I need it to be. Um, uh, so here you can see I've got multiple systems configured for continuous restore. Um, and uh, process launch, processes launching, full audit logs of the individual devices. Uh, if I come in and configure one of these, I'll see if that gives me what I want to see. Uh, so I'm doing virtual disaster recovery as one of the restore types. I could just be restoring files and folders or just a SQL database. You know, restore the SQL database to a new location, mount it in a different system, um, run it for reporting purposes. You could use it almost like backend, um, backend replication, backup then restore versus rep true replication, however. And then here are my settings for that same virtual recovery. Here going to Hyper-V, start the VM and uh, take a screenshot at the end. Uh, what am I restoring? Um, you choose your volume. So in this case, I'm restoring C and D, but you can get very granular in what you're recovering. You control, now I mentioned the IP addresses. So it creates the VM like the original, but you can configure new IP addresses, new subnets, new gateways, because this isn't just about testing. This is about failover. So this same process, the VM that it's creating is the one you're going to bring up when your production system fails. Um, that's why we um, recommend you point this to a full hypervisor in, uh, that can handle the load of your two, your four, your seven, X number of servers actually uh, swapping over, which, you know, a small end appliance might not be able to handle more than, you know, one or two failovers at a time. And then you're going to have degraded backup performance. So we separate the backup process from the recovery process. So Eric, Cliff brought up a really good and important point. Okay. The C drive is capitalized and the D drive is lowercase. That's interesting. Our, um, OC our OCD, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't actually think that the D drive exists anymore on this system. 
Um, so I think I've actually True. dismounted it. So maybe it's a, just a historic piece. It's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to look at that one. This is uh, uh, server four. Ah, I'll look into it. Um, I don't have any data on there at the moment that I can recover, but there is a partition. I don't know whether it signifies I, something specifically or not. I apologize. I just wanted to give you a hard time. <laughs> uh, I do work very closely with development, so I'll uh, I'll log it as a defect if I can recreate it. All right. So uh, let me let me go through a couple more of these questions here real quick. Sure. Do you have a Kaseya integration? Um, I don't oh, have. I don't have a direct or a native Kaseya integration. Um, I do have a full set of SOAP and REST-based APIs that you can query. Um, and I do have automated deployment capabilities so that um, you can um, uh, automate right your there. configuration. Uh, let's get right to back to the right UI. Oop, and that would right just UI. be using like a batch or a PowerShell type script? Uh, batch, PowerShell, software deployment. Um, I give you a deployment string. Um, let's see. Let me close you. There we go. So um, when you come in and add a device, um, servers and workstations, we've not even mentioned Office 365 uh, email-based backup. Oh. Um, I'll save that for a future webinar with you guys. Just a teaser there. Um, so you choose your site or your location. Um, for instance, my Canadian, um, oops, my Canadian office, and I can do a regular deployment and create a single, a unique device, uh, or I can do an automatic deployment, pick a profile, which is going to give me default selections, default filters, um, default update policies, and that's controllable by you. So we'll call this server production, and I now have a unique deployment string. This deployment string is going to be good for. Uh, every device at that location. So you're just setting up a new customer and they've got a hundred devices. This one installation string will deploy, automatically deploy all those devices. Um, it'll automatically create your encryption key, put it into our passphrase database um, uh, and um, start your selection, start your schedules. You're, you're, you're backed up and you're good to go. Uh, you can copy this to your clipboard. You can even download it. And the download is gonna give you a, um, uh, a unique uh, installation file. So um, you could use this, you could drop this into a PowerShell. I've experimented with uh, third-party software tools. I've plugged this into automation managers and different RMs. Um, so you can give it the URL that you download from and then just use this string. Um, you could even expand upon this string with more settings. There's more information here in the documentation about expanding a deployment. Um, or you can um, you know, go with something like a PowerShell, which goes out and does grab the latest version and run this and make it part of a auto-deploy so if you're deploying VMs, this could be part of your um, your standup of a new VM. So it automatically adds backup to it. This is amazing. Um, you you mentioned a documents only option. Ah. Um, is there is there like a list of extensions included online somewhere for reference and documentation? Maybe there is. Uh, so documents is a deployment methodology also. Um, it gives that same, uh, a much smaller string. So it's a single executable, run this executable only on machines at this California, or sorry, Canadian location, and they'll all be configured and added. Um, the question was, what, what, what is documents? Documents is um, this list of files. I bet, yep. Um, so documents, it's effectively, it's your Word, it's your, it's your business documents. So it's your Word, your PowerPoint, your Excels, um, uh, your uh, publisher publications, your, uh, uh, your, dot, um, uh, your dot notes, your dot sheets, um, uh, dot pages. So if you've got Mac um, uh, items as well, um, then we can grab those. The difference here is it's, it's just a light PDF? version. Of, I'm sorry? PDF? Yes. yes. PDF. Yep. I think there's 49, uh, 49, 57. Um, you're just pulling out red. I feel like you're about to go red, blue, hot, <laughs> white. <laughs> we, 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 we grow this, we expand it. So the, the two noticeable uh, items that we don't protect, um, I don't protect videos. Um, you know, most of the time those are MP3, uh, there's MP3s uh, or, or, or audio. So MP3s, movie files, MP4s. I don't grab any of that as part of documents. Um, I don't grab oh, pictures, uh, huh? 
no pig. I don't grab JPEGs. No. Um, and so something would you grab on a home, something you would protect on a home machine or a consumer machine, not really something you do with documents. Think of documents as the um, uh, loss leader. Um, it's something that we uh, price very, very uh, inexpensively for our partners. Um, it's something they could bundle or include into every one of their deployments as a base level of maybe even free backup that they're offering for the uh, combined other services they're providing. If it's you know, if there's patch and AV and, and remote monitoring, all those things, well, you know, you include this in and you've got a base level of protection, then you've got a nice, easy upgrade path to a um, full-blown workstation license or even a server license. Um, 28 days of retention, it runs twice a day. Um, you don't have the speed vault. You don't have a lot of remote control capabilities. You just set it and forget it. You don't make selections. We find the documents on all the local volumes. So we look at the local C, we look at the local USB hard, uh, USB uh, plugged in hard drives, things like that. I'm not going to look at thumb drives. I'm not going to try to back up your iPhone if you plug it in, things or those kind of things. But um, it's meant to be. Um, it, it's and even extent. if somebody, and even if somebody's dumb enough to store all of their dot doc x files in windows slash system 32 you'll find it and back oh up. yeah yeah it, it searches the entire system not just the my documents directory uh there's been requests for things like jpegs because you know uh, maybe a a, a, a an insurance office uses JPEGs for, for part of their business. Um, ideally, those wouldn't be stored on the little workstations or the, la or the, or the laptops, uh, at least not permanently. They go into a network share. They go into a, a central repository. And I'll get those with, our, with the server side. So Documents is going to supplement um, all of those machines inside of your organization that you don't want to put a full-blown uh, backup license on. It's part of that total level layer of protection. You know, um, if you think about ransomware, Ransomware comes in and it hits your couple of your servers and it hits the workstation that it came in through um, and it starts hopping around the network depending on the variant. And then you go to look at your backups. Well, you've got all these backups of your servers, and maybe your NAS devices and a couple key employee uh, that can hire or fire their workstations or laptops. But you might have a, this large group that you don't protect. And if there's business data on those machines that you didn't have stored on a network share, then it's either lost or you got to pay the ransom because you don't have you never back them up. You know, users don't always put the data on a NAS device as, as you've, you've told them to. And not everybody has roaming profiles set up and configured. So this is a nice, inexpensive way to, to give you total coverage or total protection across the environment to grab those business documents, um, you know, not the pictures and the memories from your vacation, but the business documents that are there. Um, I've been asked about QuickBooks, um, QuickBook files. Uh, Small offices, sometimes they'll run those on workstations. It'll be the only copy. I don't currently protect QuickBooks, um, so I would, rec I would point you to a, a workstation version of that or, or even the server version. Um, but um, you know, ideally, you're going to be doing QBBs anyway, and those are going to be stored on a network share or a location someplace. Do you back up QBBs? Um, not as part of the documents piece, but uh, okay. as... Um, um, yeah, standard of, licenses. Of course, we'll of course, the full. I, I, I guess I'm just going to assume that like the, the, the full desktop or server, it's going to back up everything we throw at it. Everything you throw um, at it. But the the documents one, it doesn't do QBBs either. It does not. Um, not 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 currently. Although it is something of interest. All right. Um, well, I, uh, while I know you said you would discuss Office 365 in another webinar. I can touch on it if you'd up, like. Is it going to back up uh, OneDrive or is this only emails? So this is only, um, this is only email configuration. Um, uh, we are in a early access uh, state for uh, Office 365 email protection. Um, so let's cancel. Uh, let's add, uh, add Office 365. Um, so you would basically tell this uh, my uh, uh, my domain, and um, this is going to connect you at, at, connect you as an admin out to your Office three sixty five environment, and it's going to be capable of uh, backing up your uh, your uh, mailboxes, uh, your schedules, your contacts, your tasks, and so on. Um, and um, we provide up to seven years of retention. Um, it's going to get your um, user mailboxes as well as your shared mailboxes. Um, we license based on uh, user mailboxes. So the shared mailboxes are effectively free items. Um, system's not even in a billing state today, so we're not billing for it. It's part of an early access uh, program. 
So you can actually come out and start a trial and sign up for it uh, off of our website and um, get that capability. Um, it is currently limited to um, Office 365 mail. Um, so there's not, uh, not currently a uh, implementation for um, OneDrive or SharePoint. So I'm gonna I'm gonna elaborate on that. It's currently limited to Exchange because it's uh, doing mail, contacts, calendar, tasks, right? Correct. Okay. I I just wanted to clarify since you said it's only limited to mail, but then earlier you said. Oh, okay. It, it I, 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 I I I I stink right there. So it is. It's um. It's yeah. It is limited to the to the the um to the Exchange component the exchange of Office 365. Yeah. So mail, calendars, contacts, those items. Yes. And, and how much are you going to be charging per user? Um, there's uh, promotions as part of the early access program. Um, uh, I believe the document, um, I'm not a sales guy, so let me think about this one for a second. I want to say that they're looking at $1.50 uh, per mailbox uh, US. Um, okay. Since we're still in the early uh, access program, uh, they'll get that actual final detail um, when they sign up and they'll get information on it. But there are promotions that they can lock in some promotional rates um, if they sign up for the early access. Um, connectedness now. So um, configuring this super easy. I entered my Microsoft credentials. Uh, here are my mailboxes. So this is uh, the uh, Gotham.computer domain. So I'm backing up the private email of Alfred, uh, Barbara, Bruce, Dick, Edward, and uh, Harley. Um, and, I wouldn't uh, back up Harley stuff. Well, you never know. <laughs> um, so 10 mailboxes. Uh, this is going to run every uh, two hours. Um, and, and get protection for that environment. Um, we're we're, we're complementing or supplementing the retention capabilities that already exist inside of Office 365. Um, so you, um, uh, you know, you've got your recycle bins and your double down recycle bins and um, those kind of items. Um, so we're processing the environments, the ability to, let's say you misplace an item, you even deleted it, but you misplace an item in Office 365. You can come in here, use our search queries, find the items you want to and restore them. Um, when we do our restores, we restore back to the current uh, mailbox and we... Um, in the current location too. Uh, so. No, actually, so we restore back to the current you mailbox, but we, we create a new folder. folder called restored, restore or restored. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact nomenclature on it with a time, a time date stamp. So that way, these are the items that you found and we drop them back into this folder. So we're not gonna overwrite anything in your existing mailbox. So if it was already there, it'll still be there, but you've restored it to this new new folder, then you can move it inside of Exchange wherever you, or Outlook wherever you want. Same thing for contacts and calendars. It'll create a new, uh, new restore calendar with these items on it. Um, so that way we're not gonna damage anything that, that you already have inside of a user. Um, Any word on when Exchange archives can be backed up? Um, not my project. So yeah, I'm afraid I don't know on that side of the house. Uh, they actually might work right now, I'm afraid. I, I just, I don't know. I'll have to take that when it's offline and get back to you. Let's see here. Good questions, guys. I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the depth you guys are going into here. Um, what about bare metal recovery? Is that something that's interesting? Uh, I, I would assume so. We all, we all love our image-based recovery. I, well, you know what? I don't know if bare metal because a lot of us are doing uh, VMs these days. What do you, do you guys want to see? Do you guys want to see bare metal? Eric said, not me. <laughs> so, or wait, not, not me to, we're all doing virtual machines or not me. I don't want to see bare metal. <laughs> Uh, Zach said, "Sure, okay, so yeah, let's let's see some uh, some bare metal." And okay. someone else said, "No, hold on a second. I don't want to see anything else. I just want to know what it costs." <laughs> so, um, you know, once again, not a sales guy. I can give you some some rough guidelines here. Obviously, it's going to vary by region. Um, if I were, I, I think I can answer this. If, if you go with if you go with like the the no minimums version, it's it's roughly like. 10 an endpoint or like, I want to say 40 a server. 
Um, so uh, uh, page the page you go, no commitments, uh, right? So list price I think is 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 a workstation, 10 an endpoint, um, 35, I'm sorry, uh, 50 a, um, uh, 50 a server. And then if you if you're looking at commitments or um, uh, some 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 monthly minimums, um, it'll get down to seven and thirty five, I believe. Um, uh, there are some fair use uh, caps and sizes to these machines. Uh, we do pool that data, however. So uh, fair use is uh, five hundred gigs per server, one hundred gigs per workstation. If one server's over, one server's under. But as long as you're under that fair use cap, then you're you're fine. Fully loaded. At that commitment, it means you're you're effectively paying seven cents a gigabyte. Uh, overages are charged or billed at those seven cents a gigabyte. If you have systems that go uh, way above, um, obviously that's a starting point. Talk to your account managers. Let them know what you're looking at, where you're going, um, you know how you plan to run this, and and they can uh, uh, work with you and get you a uh, uh, an actual quote. Uh, documents, document price points at a um, dollar a workstation. Can't beat basic that's, backup for a buck, right? That's actually pretty good. Um, and and then of course the, you know regular workstations is seven bucks, so it's actually not even that bad of an upsell for the you know the five you know hundred workstations in an organization. You know maybe twenty of them, five of them you need the full protection. The rest of them you can get by with the documents approach. Um, the the fair use is uh, selected size, right? Um, fair use is based on on selected size, yes. And are there any plans to maybe increase the fair use caps that you're aware of? Um, I, know, I know there's been discussions on it, but I, I couldn't tell you where those are at in, 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 in any decisions or sign-off stages. Um, but, but yeah, it is something we're constantly looking at. We're, we're constantly looking at price, market, competitive, uh, uh, the, the uh, perception. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so, so the, th the thing the thing you don't want to want to to get lost or, or caught in is the fact that you know this is a fully featured scalable upgradable solution single pane of glass um, Mac Windows Linux um, it's not you know it's not the you know two cents a gigabyte you can get from Azure for just raw storage or uh, Amazon and, and the cost you can get with Glacier those kind of things um, you might get the actual storage piece uh, a whole lot cheaper so. You know, look at the solution as a whole and from a value perspective, not just at what the you know fully loaded cost per gigabyte might be for your backups. Because um, once again, it is based on selected size. Um, and if you've got 28 days worth of retention and 12 end of months in there, um, you're still being billed based on selected size, even though you've got a year's worth of recovery capability there or possibly more. Awesome. Uh, one question is the virtual disaster recovery portal Mm -hmm. well, they said it's being accessed via the local backup client. Can that also be done from the cloud portal if the local client's not available? Ah, um, so the recovery console is a application that's deployed on the endpoint where you're doing the recovery. So um, if you've got a Hyper, uh, Hyper V box that your customer's in location, uh, you're going to access that or install that and, and configure it locally there. Um, you can't access the console. From a management perspective, it requires you locally to configure and enter and type your encryption keys and so on to configure the environment. Um, you can, once it's configured, come in and remotely access the individual virtual machines that are configured. Um, but, but that's using like Screen Connector. Um, no, no, no. That's uh, so that's that's available in here. Um, oops. So for for this system here. Uh, when I go to launch the backup client, uh, I don't mm -hmm. know it's going to work. So here's my backup instance. Here's my recovery instance. So that recovery instance is the the configuration that's that's sitting there doing continuous restore in the background. So that's what I configured in that recovery console. So if you were to click on the backup instance, uh huh. Well, can I see what happens? Uh, I get a broken connection. Let's try, <laughs> let's try that one more time. Uh, launch the backup client, uh, the backup instance. Oh, okay. I couldn't tell at first. You got a little B and a little R inside that circle. Correct, and it's not gonna it's not gonna behave nicely nicely for me right now. But um, yeah, the backup instance, the recovery instance. If I'm doing bare metal recovery, it'll create an instance here for the bare metal recovery instance as well. 
So that way you can do some remote management of the BMR environment. Um, if you, you know, you're on site, you plug in the USB stick, you start to restore, you have to leave and go to another call, what have you, then you can still remote in and manage and monitor and see what's going on from a BMR perspective. Um, we've even got a VNC instance that you can enable or run inside of it that if you do use a screen connect or take control or MSP anywhere um, to get into uh, another system inside of the same network, you can actually VNC and get um, uh, command prompt level access during the BMR. So, you know, short of inserting a CD and booting or USB stick and booting, you can do almost everything remotely. Excellent. Um, the, okay, so Cliff said, Cliff said his rep told him that the fair use was stored, not selected, after dedupe and compression. From a default state, uh, from a default uh, base go to market, I would say that's incorrect. Uh, there probably is um, or are some models, depending on use, that they can adjust or work that with. Um, your sales rep's going to be your definitive uh, response uh, answer on that one. Um, so I, I'd follow back up with them and get confirmation on it. Uh, you should have signed uh, some kind of agreement uh, or um, uh, so see what the agreement says. environment when you went to production. That will state your fair use in there as well and, and how it's measured. So, and then I see in the chat, um, you know, Zach says he includes backup on every deal and he's not even using 60% of the allocation of fair use storage. And nice. then Robert said, Windows 10 is just creating huge system state backups that eat into the fair use allotment. Um, and then my rep told me it was selected, not storage. Yeah, so select, select, selected, is the, selected is the default. Um, anything outside of that would have had to have been a discussion for some kind of unique configuration or environment. Um, let's see, uh, to the other one. Um, to get back to the right screen here, backup, client. Your, your uh, selections and your fair use. Um, a little earlier, I showed you a list of processed files and how much data was mm -hmm. actually being transferred. And you know, you can double count or you can double select some items. Um, if you're backing up VMware at a, uh, I'm sorry, if you're backing up Hyper-V at a host level, there's no reason to back up the individual VHD files as part of the Hyper-V file system. Uh, if you're backing up SQL using the SQL agent, don't back up the SQL logs and databases as part of the file system. Um, and, and that's going to be an, uh, a matter of excluding, um, you know, files and folders either in your directory tree or setting backup filters. Um, so I'll go full screen on this one. So there's no reason to back up EDB files on this machine. VHD files or VHDXs as part of the file system backup. Uh, database files, temp files. An OST. What are you going to do with an OST file? Um, it, once you recover, it's going to get resynced from the cloud anyway. I could argue there are a couple unique cases where you might want a UST. Um, the downloads directory. If you are one of our essential users or our RMM users, the temp directories where all the patches, the caches, the AV updates. Um, you know, why would you back those up? Um, Windows updates. Um, and I don't have it in my list here, but the latest Windows 10. Oh, actually, it is here. It's the Windows 10 upgrade or Windows 10 update. This uh, administrative uh, Windows BT share, you know, it's four gigs of data or more that's encrypted that, um, you know, why would you back that up? Your windows.old file. There are lots of selections you can do here or uh, exclusions you can do to uh, cut your selected size down and still have a recoverable bare metal environment. Um, we're not an image-based solution. So you have that granularity to select. Now, if I were to come in here and say C colon backslash windows and I excluded my windows directory, well, guess what? I don't have enough data now to do bare metal recovery, but I would drop my selected size down. It's really a question of what services do you want to provide to your customer? We give you the ability. It doesn't mean you have to, to, to back that directory up. If you're using default images, default deployment methodologies, automation from a deployment perspective, and all you need is um, you know, my documents and application data and certain other components, then, then just protect that. If you want the full image or the um, full synthesized image image from a recovery perspective, then um, um, there are still exclusions you can make that won't break that. Temporary internet files, cookies. Yeah, there's no reason. Hopefully that'll address their, uh, yeah. their, their question. That'll get you past the fair, so, in a lot of cases, that'll get you past the fair use. Um, and I, I'm growing this right now. Um, these we make, make available to partners for selections. Everybody's okay. environment is a little bit different. Um, 
some of these will go into global excludes here in the near future. So you won't have to exclude them. Like, uh, you know, our applications that are solar winds based, we should be excluding those automatically if they're not needed. And I'm not. Right and now. that's, and that's actually the question I'm going to ask is, is there a way for us to say globally, I just don't want to back up anything that's .tmp. Oh yeah. Or, um, so or is that, is that only client level or. It's, 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 it's both. Um, so uh, if I look at a profile level, oops. so I mentioned during the deployment, you can create profiles and I actually picked one. So um, if I don't work at a client level, I can work at a profile level and I can say that I want to back up my servers and I can have those exclusions here inside of a profile. Oops, I'm locked. I need to be at a higher level. My permissions don't allow me to edit these at this level. You can see they're little, they're locked right here. Let's go up to my MSP level. Now they are no longer locked. And I can come to servers and I can set uh, star.tmp, um, star.txt, uh, star slash uh, temporary, uh, temporary temp. Uh, int files or whatever that appropriate path is. is. Um, I could do question mark colon slash um, temp for any volume. So you can get pretty creative on, on your, your standard, standard expressions here. And once these are in a profile, I can clone these profiles to go down to in customers and, and then you know keep the same set of exclusions, modify the selections a little bit, um, tell it to use only local selections. Um, Schedule your frequencies. You know, I want to run every hour. Don't start during working hours on certain days of the week. Um, so lots of things you can set at a global um, or site or customer level. Um, we do honor the Windows Do Not Backup registry setting as well. So anything that's in the Windows Do Not Backup registry, like your um, uh, offline files folders, your um, uh, certain registry ent entries, your uh, swap file and your Hibernate files, you know, we exclude those automatically. Um, it's just that uh, temporary internet files used to be excluded by those set settings as well. Now that we've got, you know, four or more commercial browsers that you can utilize, they all have their own unique paths. Um, so yeah, I have those in my lists as well. Um, and then going back a, a little ways. Sure. Uh, Ed asked a follow-up question. Uh, we were talking about booting and and having a screenshot available yes so he said you know booting it as a virtual machine and then taking a screenshot doesn't actually prove it was restored successfully only that it got to the login screen is there something else that can be done uh to you know to vary services and databases or to verify services and databases are started uh, started and functional and i believe that um, you showed us we're able to look at that whole system event log there. Um, so here, uh, volume should have a copy requester in a running state. So um, you could see a service, uh, SQL service started. You could see services running, um, but even a service running doesn't mean that the database is going to mount. Um, so there's so many levels that you, layers you could take this. So the extent I guess I'm going to have is, is, is what you're seeing here. Um, at any point, you could come in and, and actually boot this virtual machine yourself um, and do those prescribed individual tests, whether that be with PowerShell scripts or, or manual tasks. Um, what I found is that most partners aren't doing disaster recovery testing, and they're not even testing their restores from their backups. Um, but the ones that are doing DR testing, uh, they charge their customers for it. It is a value stream or a revenue, a revenue margin stream for you, uh, or it justifies your cost per month in your service plan. The um, uh, so definitely something you can charge for. It's a differentiator that you have. Um, if you're using this tool to do the automated uh, verification points and it's happening on a daily basis, uh, corresponded corresponding with your backups, then here you've got those automated proof of performance um, checkpoints. Um, what you might do then is schedule a higher level of service where um, you or your technicians are going in and performing some of those tests, or better yet you involve your customers in the DR testing. Who better is going to know if the applications and the databases are working the way they should um, 
boot the environment uh, in the hypervisor, uh, take a, a checkpoint so that you can roll back, let them go in and manipulate and play um, in that isolated network, obviously, um, run a report, do a query, those kind of things, get them involved in a quarterly or annual every six month DR test, charge them for the privilege, um, and, and it's going to be that added layer of proof of performance that, yes, things are working the way they should be. Would I liked, like full automated scripting and some other items in there? I definitely would. It's just the, the, the possibilities are endless, so um, uh, not anything on the short term. Um, what, what kind of bandwidth do you have for restores? You know, like if, for example, someone's using uh, Google Fiber and they've got a one meg, or I'm sorry, one gig connection, um, how fast are we actually going to be able to download from you? So our data centers utilize um, multiple, uh, so data centers um, utilize multiple storage nodes in multiple racks. Each rack, I'm sorry, each, each node is um, uh, multiple gigabit connections um, uh, on uh, different network segments, uh, on different network providers, and um, uh, multiple gigabit connections coming into the data centers or 10G connections, depending on the regions. Um, we don't auto throttle um, uh, or, or, or uh, that's what I'm looking for, not auto. We don't, um, we don't falsely, we don't, we don't pick an artificial limit from a throttle perspective. So the restore is going to pull um, uh, at the client level. So remember the data is deduped, compressed and encrypted. Um, we try to run with very low resources. So the restores, um, the backup client itself uses at most one CPU core and it'll use up to 500 gigabytes of, um, uh, of uh, RAM. No, um, I'm sorry, five, um, yeah, 500 gigs of RAM. Um, and it's going to pull the cabinets that it needs down, cache them, store them if it needs them for other restores, pull out the items it needs, rehydrate the dedupe data and lay it down on disk. So it's a, it's a pull model. So it's gonna request and buffer data as it needs it. So the CPU, the bandwidth, the speed of the disk, those are all gonna be factors in the restore. Um, I um, was going to see if I had a screenshot here. I actually asked a customer to send this to me. I helped them with a bare metal recovery uh, sometime last week. And uh, we were watching the restore. Um, this was utilizing their local speed vault uh, plugged into a, uh, a two drive NAS on a local gigabit uh, connection. And we were peaking around the 700 megabit per second, um, low end around the four to 500 megabit per second. Um, and then, oh, course, what was the high end? Uh, around seven. Um, seven gigabit? Uh, so around 700 megabit on a gigabit connection. Um, the, and obviously those are going to vary. Um, a low end machine with low amounts of RAM that's having trouble processing, or if the data is highly compressed and uh, uh, not, or, or not dedupable, those are all going to play factors in, in how it pulls the data and lays it down. Um, that guy had the vault, so it was not even taking advantage of the cloud. Um, if it were on a Google Fiber connection or AT and T or whoever's fiber connection, um, we can pull those or pull, hit those same kind of rates from the the cloud. Um, most of our traffic is upload traffic, the nightly nightly backups, um, but the the channels are um, uh, you know it's the same upload and as download capabilities. So um, we're kind of a reverse commute, if you will, from what most internet providers uh, are seeing. Okay. Oh, let's see here. Let's speed. We already talked about that. Backup systems are only good. We talked about that. Um, Can you download a VHD of a backed up server from the cloud management portal? Um, no, no. So we don't store VHDs in our cloud. The cloud is random encrypted ones and zeros. So there is no VHD in the cloud. Any VHD that you have or create, you create on the local client or through that recovery console. Now you can create it reactively on demand after the customer calls and there's a failure, or you could configure it for continuous restore so that it's sitting there waiting and it's just a matter of turning it on when the customer calls, or it could just create a flat VHD file on disk that you're going to copy onto a USB stick and, and sneaking it out to the customer or roll out a hype, roll out a, a off lease, off lease server as a hypervisor and stand up a hypervisor in their environment. We've got partners that do that as well. They, provide the hypervisor in the event of an outage with the data on it. Okay. 
Um, um, if I had a VHD in the cloud, then it would be uh, it'd be a security breach because a, a VHD could be attached, mounted, booted, worked with. So. Um, I realize you're going to bounce this to an account manager. Okay. Who doesn't exist. I don't know what that means. But is SolarWinds able to provide internal use slash not for resale so I don't have to pay to test out the standalone backup product internally? Um, so we, we, we do offer a trial. Um, so you can sign up for a trial. Um, you can sign up for as many trials as you wanted to, uh, really, um, if you want, while you're testing the environment out. If you talk to your account manager and you need to go beyond the standard 28-day uh, period, as long as you're keeping them involved in the loop, they can extend your trials. Um, so that's going to be the way, the, the 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 best way to work. Um, if you're already an established customer and you want some some test bed environment or play environment, things like that. Um, uh, I think still starting a new trial, standing that up would probably be your best bet. Okay. So no, no true NFRs. No, tr no true NFRs. No, the the the, the da for the most part NFRs they NFRs go stale. The data sits there. There's no activity on them. Uh, it's burning cloud resources, uh, things like that that w could be available to other customers. Um, so the the trial process is probably the best. Um, um, no reason you shouldn't put documents all of on all of your internal systems though. Fair enough. Um, that's all the questions so far. Wow. Really good stuff. Guys. I, say, I say so far, but holy cow, it's already 2.30. <laughs> with, with all this typing I've been doing, I thought maybe it was 150 at best. Um, so let's, let's do this. Um, let's look at these poll results. Okay. I think you might find this interesting. Definitely. So of everyone that was here at, at the most earlier, we had 15 people live here in the room. Um, Five people use SolarWinds backup today. Ten days. Nice. Okay. Um, Sixty-seven percent of the people do not use any SolarWinds products at all today. Um, most of them, more than half, are backing up uh, between one and ninety-nine desktops. Um, Forty percent are backing up between one and nine servers. Uh, more than half are doing image-based backups on desktops and servers. Okay. And I have no idea how, but we we tied all the way across on my last and yet most important question. Star Wars. <laughs> <or Star Trek>. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, what what are your thoughts on this? You know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely pro, um, uh, pro Star Trek, but I do have my, my uh, toys as well for us. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's not what I meant, Eric. Oh, that was the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> what, that was the last what, what are your, that's true. That's true. What, what, what are you thinking? Like, you know, you, you hear, you know, more than half of the people here are doing image-based backups on their desktops and servers. Um, we've got less than 100 desktops on average. We've got under 10 servers on average. Um, so, so image level back, um, and, and, and it's not, so it's not, it's not a full, uh, it's not a full question. Um, so there, there is a pre preconceived notion that file level backup is for selective data. You know, I want to get my, my documents and this, and I want to get that. Um, and that you need image level backup if you want things like bare metal recovery or virtualization and, and disaster recovery booting and so on. And, we, we took the opposite approach. Um, we've got file and folder level backup for the granularity to get exclusions. Don't back up things you don't need. Don't back up volumes you don't want or, or, or directories you don't want. And we still give you the benefits of uh, recovery benefits that you would get with an image level solution. Um, we've got uh, tracking technology, what we call our backup accelerator so that you can see the same kind of speed benefits that you'd have with image level solutions. So it's, a, it's kind of best of both worlds if you think about it. Uh, you get all of the granularity and, and all of the recovery capabilities. Um, so I, I really try to displace that. You know, um, people will lump file and folder backup with things like Google Drive and, and, and Dropbox and those kind of things, which they're not. You know, those are sync and share tools that really don't 
until recently provide a level of backup and they are susceptible to damage and encryption and, and, and so on. Um, I'd encourage the folks to look, if, if, you, if you're stuck on the image because it was the only option, take a look at this and see if it can uh, shrink your data sizes, uh, decrease the amount of data you're sending across the wire to the cloud. A lot of people will do image only because, and they'll keep it local because they can't get the images or at least not all the images off to the cloud. Um, so it's a bolt-on cloud offering for some copy. We store oh, data locally and remote. I made you think of a and, question. Yeah, so you've got your local speed vault. Yep. Can the local speed vault like do the whole C and D drive image, whatever you want to think of it as, and then we just send some of maybe like the mission critical files off to the cloud? It's a good question, but no, actually it can't. The vault is meant to be a mirror of your um, of your of of what you back up. So whatever's in the cloud and stored exists on the vault. Now that super high level of data deduplication that that um, I've mentioned um, a lot makes this possible. So um, I've got uh, rest um, my data selected on this machine, 156 gigs. On my speed vault is 220 gigs used. In the cloud is 222 gigs used. If I go look at my restore capabilities here, and I want to go back, I have data back um, from uh, I have data back to February the first. Um, so these are our archive points that I can restore. Um, That's really cool. And I assume some of those days don't have any color because that machine may have just been off. Weekend, the machine was off. Um, um, uh, so, and and when we look at it's not, it's not just one daily backup either. When I look at the fifth, uh, I'm backing up every hour here from 8 a.m. until 11 p.m. Uh, except for nine, except for nine and ten. Why is that? Let's look at that. I don't have a nine and ten schedule for some reason. Interesting. <laughs> I'll have to look at that. But um, can can a laptop out in the field get an image-based backup? Uh, sent online without the use of an external hard drive. Could a laptop in the field get an image-based backup without the use of an external hard drive? Oh, are you um, talking about the speed vault? So, I, I um, mean that? So the the so I'm working on a laptop here. Um, now I have a speed vault for this laptop, but it's not required. Um, if I've got a remote user that's only backing up to the cloud, then all the data exists in the cloud. If you needed to, um, that, that laptop is, is gone, it was stolen. Um, the MSP orders a replacement laptop, pulls one off the shelf, um, installs the bare metal recovery uh, tool, boots it up, picks the, uh, the point in time, and it re-images the machine like the other. Uh, we can support dissimilar hardware, UEFI, GPT, all of those pieces. Um, uh, if they didn't want to go that route, if they wanted to just synthesize a virtual machine and let it run on top of the Windows 10 Pro hypervisor temporarily, they could do that. Uh, they could even stand it up in their own Hyper-V or the customer's Hyper-V or VMware that they have. Um, SolarWinds does not currently provide a uh, SolarWinds hosted recovery location or recovery target. So you know, there is no login to SolarWinds.com and boot your virtual machine in our facilities. So... Uh, Speed Vault is only there to get you quick access to the data in a recovery. Correct. Speed access or Speed Vault is not required to do backups. Correct. It's an optional component. This is my Speed Vault, and it looks like. But but what if and, and yeah okay so what if um. And I'm not going to worry about, I don't care about overages and fair use crap right now. Okay. We're just mm -hmm. playing the what if game. Sure. Um, what if I've got one terabytes of stuff on a computer system that needs backed up? Okay. So uh, a, ter a terabyte of data on a system, the initial backup, let's say it, it dedupes and compresses down to 700 gigs in space, give or take, probably a little more than that. That's um, a lot to transfer over the wire. Is there so, an other solution? There is. So your initial backup, um, it can go to the vault and to the cloud simultaneously. It will complete, whichever one is faster. If it completes to the vault, it will finish and, and, and tell you that operations are complete. It will slowly, behind the scenes, synchronize up to the cloud 
if you allow it to until they're fully in sync. Um, so if the device is offline, the cloud's offline, the vault's offline, they'll sync behind the scenes. If you don't want to do that, um, you don't want to send that across for the seven machines over that slow connection, we have seeding capabilities, which allow me to specify a network share or a local drive letter, which will basically redirect the cloud back up to this local vault or this, sorry, this local seed uh, path temporarily. Um, first backup or any backup that you choose to seed will go to that location. You either ship that drive to us, encrypted, deduped, and compressed, or you take it to a location where the MSP has a faster upload, Google Fiber, and um, you can self-service upload that yourself uh, into our cloud. Um, and that is using the uh, server tool, uh, which is available here for uh, seeding purposes. That's cool. Reverse um, seeds are possible also. So uh, you had a speed vault and it failed, or you've never had a speed vault, but you need to do a restore and you're waiting on the hardware to come in. You could pre download the speed vault to your facility um, while you're waiting on the hardware to come in to help speed the restore when it actually gets there. Perfect. I think that answers. Um, so uh, 20, 24 by seven, follow the sun support. Okay. Um, no, no service fees or anything charged to that support. It's accessible. Um, uh, you do rate your, your service tickets when you open them. There's chat based tickets as well as dialing in. Um, if you've got mission critical data loss outage systems, obviously dial in and talk to a tech live um, as opposed to, to starting a, an online chat. Um, please always tell us about the level of, of, of uh, uh, severity. Um, you know, the tech may, uh, you know, the tech doesn't always assume the same level of severity that you may assume. So please let us know if you need to escalate or move up the chain to a application engineer, a backline engineer, those kind of things, then, then please do that. And, and, you know, involve us if you've got ransomware, if you've got, how do I do this? When do I do that? Um, deployment configurations, things you're looking for. Okay. Uh, Zach asked if the standby backup image ever comes back. Standby image. So standby image was a generation one uh, disaster recovery option that we, we created. Um, it's n been deprecated. It was uh, removed in 79, so September of last year. Um, so any versions of the software released that you deploy uh, that are newer than 17.9, they don't have the option. Um, if you deployed an older client that had standby image turned on in 17.9 and then upgraded it, it would keep the feature. So the feature doesn't go away. We're just not doing new development on it. Um, it created a local VHD file during your backups um, and updated it behind the scenes, but it was it had some limitations. It would not work with NAS devices that um, uh, were sparse, that, that were using SMB1 or SMB2.0 uh, shares. It had to be at least 2.1 or later. Um, couldn't be compressed or encrypted. Um, you know, there, there were several limitations. Virtual disaster recovery supports the same environments. It supports multiple hypervisors, um, and it can do file and application level restore. So the majority of the functionality has been moved or migrated over to uh, the recovery console, uh, multi-instance. It does mean you have to have a second machine, though, to do that, that environment, whereas standby image was each machine taking care of its own automated VM creation and restores. If the system failed, you still had to have another machine in order to boot the VM and work with it. Um, so we felt like we were putting all of our eggs in one basket. Um, and, and it was just limited by the uh, hypervisor support. So deprecated in favor of recovery console as a, a gen two or, or next generation offering. Um, if you still want to use it, um, uh, talk to our support guys. Um, they can get you a, uh, an older client uh, to start your deployments with and then use that for your deployments, turn the settings, settings on and then allow it to do the audio updates. All right. Um, if I do file and folder backup with SolarWinds, mm -hmm. will it conflict with Windows Server backup, image backup? Can I do belt and suspenders in that case? If they like my analogy. That's good. They um, love that analogy. So um, if you're going to do us for file and folder, um, uh, you want to make sure that the schedules are not going to overlap with uh, the schedules that you've set for the um, Windows image level. Um, mm -hmm. The Windows image level, if, if, as what I know, it's it's creating a persistent image, so it doesn't have to do like a full incremental, full differential approach. So you should be fine. Just watch your 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 um, uh, your timing, 
and watch that you um, uh, don't fill up all of your VSS space. So the, the amount of space you configure for the VSS uh, snapshots that are stored, um, you know, make sure that those aren't going to be used or fully, fully utilized by, by one or the other application. And that's going to be true for any uh, third-party tool that you use. Um, the only other place I can think of a major conflict is going to be um, uh, when you've got something like SQL Enterprise Manager and you're doing SQL fulls and incrementals or fulls and differentials through Enterprise Manager because you need long trun log truncation and log rollback and all of that kind of capabilities. Um, those create a chain where the incrementals are dependent upon the full. And if you break them or tell it you did another, commit another backup in the middle, it, it will uh, disturb everything before then. So we can go into a special uh, copy only mode so we can work right alongside uh, SQL Enterprise. Um, that's only gonna come into play when you've got true DBAs using SQL as opposed to just your, your general, DB, general SQL users. Um, suggestions for locating the speed vault on the network to make it less vulnerable to ransomware, NAS or non-domain join PC? Very, very good question. So I'm using a local drive, which is I don't, which is not my recommendation. When you go to configure network share, we actually give you those recommendations. So um, if you are running a domain environment um, and you're using domain security to access the uh, NAS device for the speed vault, um, be, be careful there, be, where, be, you know, you're changing passwords frequently. You don't want to break connectivity to your speed vault because you forgot to come in and change this. I'll typically recommend work group level security for those NAS devices and use unique sets of credentials so that, that you're not using user shares on the same NAS. Um, you don't want map drives and map volumes so that your cryptos can jump and, and, and penetrate the vault. Um, so work group level security, unique usernames and passwords to access the LSV. Um, we are smart enough that if the vault is corrupted or encrypted, we're not going to synchronize it up to the cloud. Um, but it, it, it's still, it's not usable if it's damaged. So um, you do want to protect it. Um, if you do just share out a Windows a volume on a Windows server, then um, yeah, set up unique security. Don't just use an admin share to access it. Awesome. Um, remediation. Um, yeah. So backup is 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 critical. It's the last line of defense if you run into a ransomware. Um, it, it's not your first line of defense though. So don't jump the gun. I don't care whose backup you're using. Uh, customers hit by ransomware, don't immediately start cleaning the environment thinking you can restore from backup. Um, isolate the machines, look through your logs, figure out, figure out when your last good backup is. Use your logs to figure out how the infection came in. You'll see the changes in anybody back, anybody's backup application, you'll see the changes, the large amount of, amount of new files, the deletion of files, you can pinpoint where it came in. Um, measure twice, cut once. So try virtual recoveries, try bare metal recoveries, pull the hard drive out of that laptop, plug a new hard drive in, upgrade SSD while you're at it and recover the system that way. But don't break the customer's ability to pay the ransom until you know you can get the data back for them. Um, and if your customers ask you to pay the ransom, you probably need to figure out how you're going to do that. Um, if the data doesn't exist, it's not your data. I don't really encourage us to pay ransoms and so on, but ultimately it's your customer's data and they will find a new provider or somebody to help them if you're not willing to help them. So um, know how to buy Bitcoin and, and um, recommend the higher level protection. You know, under protection is as bad as no protection, but you know, in, in all cases, if there's a device that wasn't backed up, it is sometimes quicker to possibly pay the ransom than to rebuild all that data, especially if you don't have a good backup. Hmm. All right. My brain hurts. <laughs> in a good way, it's, it's, a it's a lot of stuff to take in. I could talk for four hours on this without covering too much at the same time, but um, you know, backup is backup. It's an established, mature product. I don't do anything different than anybody else does um, for the most part. It is, it's backup, it's restore, it's, it's, it's vanilla, um, but it's a combination of all of the pieces, the multi-tenancy, the security, the high level of dedupe and compression that makes it all work. Um, there's, there's specific deployment methodologies and automation you can come to to make this turnkey, click, click, done. Um, I'll only recommend people go in, they set up a 
good, better, best offering. This is my my loss leader. I bundle with everything. This is my basic offering. This is my premium or my platinum offering. And turn on and off the features that they don't want to sell or provide to their customers. You don't support Mac, turn the feature off. You don't support bare metal recovery at this price point you're going to charge your customer, then turn that feature off so it's not there or viable or visible. Um, that way you don't get into a case of putting more recovery effort into a system than you're, than you're, than you're charging for. Um, That's a really good idea. So customers, customers assume service levels if you don't define them. Now, you might have a service level that says you're going to back up this server and these volumes on, on these days and retain it for this amount of time. But when it comes to data recovery, you may or may not have a service level. It might be time and material. It might be a billable rate, a predefined rate. It could be built into your bundled package. Um, first restore each month is free. Second one is chargeable. Second ransomware, third ransomware is chargeable, whatever, whatever you want to define. But define some of those packages for your customers up front. I don't care whose product you use because if you don't set that expectation, they'll make their own expectation of how deep they want you involved during that recovery. And you can easily sync your entire team into a site for a large ransomware uh, restore, um, you know, if you know something was missed, you know, uh, we didn't have uh, AV and patch on this one machine, and something got in, and now we're using backup to restore things. Well, it's not a backup problem. Backup's your tool to recover, and just because they paid for backup doesn't mean they've paid you for restore. So think about those. You don't. You're doing this to help your customers, and and obviously. Um, grow your business and the offerings. You don't want this to turn into a time sink or a money sink. So set those expectations up front. That's all the business advice I have. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it, Eric. This, this has been so fun to watch because, you know, I, I can tell that you, you really know what you're talking about. You really enjoy what you do. And, and that's, that's reflected in, in your demeanor and your presentation style and everything. So <laughs> Good to hear. I, I, um, I really do appreciate that for, for those of you that are still here with us um, next week, we are going to do uh, two webinars. Uh, one of them is going to be a round table on Thursday. And the other one is going to be Pulseway an RMM solution. So go check those out. Um, if you are not a member of MSP webinars, um, there's a lot more content than just these webinars. So uh, feel free to go to the website, www.mspwebinars.com. Uh, there's a button you can click uh, to tell you why you should join. Uh, go check that out and let me know if you have questions. There is a chat feature on that website as well. For those of you that are members, I recommend hopping into the Zoom room after this. And we can have a nice discussion about uh, Eric and uh, his last name and how it so closely reflects his <laughs> hairstyle. Uh, we can we can chat about uh, we can chat about SolarWinds backup, how cool I think it is, uh, and and anything else that you guys want to talk about. So Eric, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you everyone that was able to make it here, and I do hope that. You all have a wonderful, wonderful week.